All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Kevin Snow, who is up in Minnesota. How are you doing, Kevin? I am great, John. How are you doing today? Doing fantastic. And I'm delighted to welcome Kevin back for another interview. He's the founder of Time on Target. And he is a sales expert, technology geek, entrepreneur, technology master, and apparently Star Wars fan, because I think you're, you're, one of your Star Wars things is going to take off behind you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we're going to talk about a fascinating subject today. We're going to talk about sales as a conversation, but also we're going to touch on, on the fact that you know people still kind of labor under the misconception that to be a successful salesperson, you have to be extremely outgoing. You have to be very, you know, you have to be able to like straight in, like develop a relationship immediately and sort of dominate the conversation and overwhelm the person. And salespeople are born, they're not made, all of that stuff. So we're going to, we're going to talk about that stuff today. So um, let's get straight into it, uh, Kevin, right? Your approach to selling is one that I think anybody from any, any, personality type can be successful successful with because you look at you look at sales a little bit differently so do you want do you want to give us an idea of your actual approach to selling yeah so uh, you know I, I i'm an introvert so i naturally had to learn how to sell a little bit differently i tried to sell like the extroverts and be you know loud verbose you know using all the the power closes and everything and i couldn't do it because it was not authentic to my personality type you know i couldn't pull off those types of closes and then i'd leave the meeting and i'd feel gross so i i got to a point if i wanted to be in sales and actually make money and you know stop eating ramen i had to figure out how to do it so so for me and it, it took a while to do it but for me the the big thing now that I try and tell everyone when we're talking about how to sell more effectively is, you know, stop focusing on the close, stop trying to get the yes, and really focus on getting closure for the conversation you're in. And, and there's a difference. You know, yes, we want to get them to say yes, because that's how we get our paycheck. But if you're, that's all you're focused on, you're going to try and push them too, too fast. And it's not going to, they're, they're not going to feel happy with the outcome and they're not going to, it's going to be harder for them to say yes. So for me, the way I think about it is whenever we have conversations with friends or we have conversations with our families or, you know, our partners, girlfriends, whoever, that conversation always ends up with next steps. You know, if I'm talking to my mm -hmm. buddy, you know, hey, Cool. All right. So I'll call you on Friday and we'll figure out the stuff for the barbecue on Saturday and perfect. And that's how you end the call. But there's always that next step in the relationship. You know, let's hey, I'll give you a call Tuesday or let, hey, let's, let's get tickets for the game or let's do this. There's always that next step. Sales has to be the same way. When you get to the end of that conversation, there has to be closure and both sides need to be really happy with how the conversation went and how it ended. And if you try and yeah. get them to say yes, you're not getting that. Is you're now back to that that salesperson prospect dynamic as opposed to two peers talking to each other. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I agree because one of the things that I always find yeah difficult is um, you know when I'm on the receiving end of it is is when a salesperson is not just trying to close you, but even, even as you said, you know, you're having a conversation with, with somebody, you know, and you're saying, okay, you know, I'll call you on Friday and we'll do it. You don't go, can you get out your calendar right now? Are you available Friday? When exactly on Friday? Okay. Cause I'm going to call you then and blah, blah, blah. And you know, and, and you start to immediately feel kind of backed into a corner yep. again and your, your defenses go all the way back up. Yeah. And even with things like networking, where you have that one-to-one uh, -one meeting with a potential new referral partner or some cool guy, gal that you met at a networking event, at the end of that meeting, there should be, hey, what are we going to do next? That might be, hey, I'm going to follow up with these people and get you an introduction. Or it, it might be scheduling that next meeting to figure out, hey, how do we collaborate together more? But the other side of that, when you have those next steps and you get that closure, is the idea that, all right, so if you don't hear from me by Tuesday with those introductions, it's okay for you to call me. 
or vice mm -hmm. versa. And people will say, hey, I'm going to follow up and I'll get you these referrals. I'm like, awesome. By when? And they'll be like, mm -hmm. Friday. Cool. So if I don't hear from you by Friday, is it okay if I give you a call on Monday? And they're always like, oh, absolutely, right. totally, because probably I, I spaced it off and uh, yeah, the reminder would be awesome. So now you have that permission to follow up when things don't get done on time. But everyone's still happy with how the conversation went. And everyone knows, hey, here's what I got to do next. And that's how you move that relationship forward so that you're staying in sync with your prospect and you're still getting them closer to the yes. Yeah, yeah, you know what I uh, what I like what you said there is the the thing about the the getting permission because it's a as you said it's supposed to be a conversation between peers, and you know taking the next step should be something that's you know mutually advantageous or you've come to the point where yeah you both want to do it so I like that idea of the, of permission because I feel like a lot of times um, salespeople just forge ahead without getting the permission to forge ahead. Oh yeah, because they're all they're they're focused on the yes. They're getting they're focused on that big yes at the end. And how do I get there as quickly as possible? And what do I need to get them to to do that thing, as opposed to figuring out, hey, how do I advance the conversation and advance the relationship? You know, if you get your process down of how you move people through those types of conversations, you can accelerate the sales process pretty quickly. You know, I, mm -hmm. I do digital marketing. And I do anything from one-time projects to multi-month engagements at a few thousand dollars a month. And I can one call close my clients because I understand how to move them through that conversation and in one conversation. But it's because I'm focused on making sure that they are happy at the end of the conversation. Even if they say no, we're both cool with it. It's now no, there's, it gets rid of all that pressure of, I need to have a yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, because one of the things I think that a lot of people struggle with, and this is it's not it's not even losing opportunities to to competitors, which you know is is disappointing in its own right, but it's losing it to no decision, and because you haven't established, you know, you haven't moved the conversation, you haven't established the relationship, and you've given them the opportunity to sort of go, mm, and then just sort of disengage. And that's the, probably the most frustrating. Like, we all understand losing to, to competitors not recently, but losing to no decision, I often think that's something that we have to take a lot more responsibility for. Well, and there's also the whole concept of losing to not making change. That, yeah. that is a that is an option whenever you're trying to uh, help a company change how things are doing to get different results. They can say, hey, we kind of like the status quo, actually. We're going to stay with it. Uh, and a lot of salespeople forget that that is an option on the table. So mm -hmm. it's it's really, you know, from our role as a salesperson, you know, we're kind of the quarterback for the process. So it's really yeah. up to us to make sure that things are moving. And, you know, one of the big points where you get the, you know, the no decision is when you do that proposal. And I, I see tons of salespeople that just really screw that up. And they'll be like, oh, totally, I'll get you a proposal. And they'll go back to the office and spend hours putting together the proposal and then email it over. Mm -hmm. And then, yep. and then, and then wait for like someone to call or to, uh, you know, they'll start doing the follow up game like every three days. Like, all right, so just following up on yeah. the proposal I sent over. And they never, and then they get ghosted. So it's mm -hmm. understanding how to make build the processes. And so that's not an option. So when I do proposals, the occasional time I do them, we now, prior to me even saying yes, I need, I find out why a proposal is needed. You know, is right. it someone else that's coming in that they need to show it to? What's going on? If that's the issue, then I know I didn't do my job because now I got to get that person in a meeting because I don't want to give them a proposal without having talked to them. But I, I figure out what's going on and then I make them agree to what they want in it. So I have them tell me, hey, here's all the things I want to see in the proposal. Sweet. Perfect. Everything that I put in that proposal, I should have already gotten some sort of verbal agreement with who. There should mm -hmm. never be a surprise in that proposal. And then I set up, all right, I will happily send you this proposal, but when are we going to jump on a call and actually review it together? So yeah. I will always make sure I have that next step of, all right, so I'm going to send you this on Monday, and then we're going to meet on Wednesday to review it together. 
so that there's no more of the, hey, so I'm just following up on that email I sent you with the proposal and I never hear back. Yeah. No, I, I think I, I, a fantastic point. I want to kind of double underline that because I I don't recall any sales for your person that I've dealt with, even recently, you know, when I've been you know, getting products or services or whatever, nobody's ever asked me what I would like to see in a proposal. They just literally do what you said. Send me over the proposal. If I'm actually, if it's something I'm really interested in and I want to do and I'm highly motivated, that's fine. But a lot of the times it happens what you say. It I look at it, it sits there and then I, you know, get bombarded <laughs> well and, and they're usually when they when you do the just the you know the stock proposals where they do that they're usually like three pages at the front full of just yeah. wasted paper of them saying it's showing the whole history of their company and 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 all that stuff and i i don't care i want to you know if i'm doing a proposal it's usually to get someone else to say yes uh so yeah. i need the things that are going to that they want to know so it, it's I'm in the military, I'm in the army. So I know mm -hmm. when I go talk to my commander as one of his staff officers with a issue or with a proposed solution, there are specific things I need to tell him so that I can get a decision from him at, at that point. It, you know, I don't need to give him all the background. Right. I need, I need to let him know, hey, here's a situation. Here is the options for you, sir. And here is what's going to happen with either of those and how the enemy is going to react. Which one do you want us to do? And then he yeah. can ask other questions. But it's the same way with working with businesses. You need to know what specific information they want so that they can make the decision. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that, that, that's a really excellent point because I do think, yeah, that you know, not enough time is spent understanding, you know, what it is they what it is they want, what are the trigger points for them, what's important to them. Because, like you said, I mean, if I get a twenty-page proposal, and eighteen pages of it are kind of like irrelevant to me, you you probably actually just move the ball backwards rather than yep. forwards. Yeah, if I and get a twenty-page. Page, if I get a 20 page proposal, I'm probably not going to read it anyway, because I'm going to look at it, it's like, I don't have time for a small book right now. So, you know, it's just going to get pushed to the side and I'm going to put off reading it until it's just, oh, I, I guess it's not that big of an issue. I'm not going to make a decision anymore. Yeah. And and reading, reading the because what you said, I mean, you go to your commanding officer, you know exactly what that commanding officer is looking for, you know. Uh, and the same thing is if you've gone through a conversation and you've gone through a process with somebody, you, sh you should at that stage kind of know what type of person they are. And as you said, ask them what they want. I mean, for I had a I had a I had a CEO years ago who was a background in accounting and if he called you in to talk about something and you brought a spreadsheet you needed to make sure that there wasn't any mistake in the spreadsheet if there's a mistake in the spreadsheet meeting was over don't matter yep. what you had to say meeting was over because that's all he cared of he, he f focused in on so really and i think it's the same is really like during that conversation you should be sort of creating an, a composite of what this per the people that you're dealing with are like yeah, it, you, you need to understand what their key decision factors are. And that comes through the, that initial meeting and where you're talking to them and finding out what the issues are and what they're trying to achieve and how they want to achieve it and what's important to them and the impacts on, on their business and their life if we achieve those things. Mm -hmm. And then that's all the things that you're able to build into your proposal or the solution that you present to them even if you don't do a proposal. But it's also important, you know, especially if you have a more complicated type product, you know, with IT, for example, where there's usually some implementation process that you go mm -hmm. through and, and different things that go on. You need to talk to them about all that stuff prior to putting it on paper. Yeah. Because if you don't and you surprise them with, all right, so here's how we're going to do implementation. You've just opened up this whole new bucket of information yeah. that they've never seen, that they're not gonna have a ton of questions about. And you've just basically taken yourself back about three steps in the sales process. So, you know, a proposal is an okay tool if you use it right, but if you don't, it can totally derail your entire sales process. Oh yeah, for sure. Because if you think about it, suddenly if you suddenly spring the implementation stuff or you haven't really talked about that, then then they're starting to think, oh, well, that means I have to involve this person and that person. And now they're going, oh, hang on a second. I wasn't expecting to do that. So, yeah, you're raising a whole raft of, of objections. 
Yeah, and I, I know lots of people who've done the the sales thing where they get them to say, yes, this is awesome. We want to do this product and cool. And then they start having the implementation talks and they're like, all right, this is this isn't what all what we expected. And they lost the deal because they weren't they hadn't included it when they were talking about the value and the process and how they were going to help. And it was this, you know, just giant brick wall that came up in front of the client that they couldn't get through to complete the deal. Yeah. And I know you're, you're um, obviously you do a lot of work with process and you're a big believer in process and automation, all of that. And I think, I think often when, when, when people encounter problems like that uh, towards the end of this end of their sales cycle, it shows issues with the process, particularly the early, early part of the process. Because if you're, if you, if these big things are coming up at the end, you haven't done your job earlier in the process. Yeah, exactly right. It you know you need to understand how your clients make purchasing decisions, and that is one of the key things. It, whenever I talk to clients uh, about their sales process, and I ask them, all right, so walk me through how your buyers make a decision. It, it's usually blank stares. Mm. You know, it's for probably 90% of them, they haven't thought that far ahead. You know, most small businesses don't even understand how they make the sale. <laughs> they they know the big steps, but they don't know all the, the processes that go at, go into each stage of the cycle, let alone, you know, that understanding that their, their buyer is going through a process too of how they're yeah. looking at things and how they're uh, processing information and, and what information needed at the, each stage to help them make the decision to move them to that next step of the process. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, and the other thing I think that people forget sometimes is that a buying process, just like a selling process, it's not a, it's not a, a static thing. It's a dynamic thing that changes over time. And I, I did a, I did a presentation once, I think it was in Hong Kong and it was all about, you know, the changing buyer behavior. And somebody from the audience asked, is that, well, how do we know how our how our customers and uh, their buying behavior has changed? And I said, well, it's it's actually quite simple. You just ask them. You just ask them, and it's funny. It's like people don't ask that question about you know. So, what process do you normally go through when you're evaluating or buying you know a product like ours? Well, and it's it's funny because I do that with uh, my clients when we're going to build out a sales process and we start having the buyer process discussion. Uh, and we'll talk about, right, so how are we getting this information? And they'll say, think, hey, we're going to do surveys. We're going to do stuff like that. I'm like, no, we're, we're going to bring in your clients. And we're actually going to mm -hmm. ask them questions and have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with them and get some really cool information out of them. And, and they're kind of in shock. They're like, people come in and answer those questions in person. I'm like, yeah, if they like you, they're totally going to want to because they want you to get better and, and be around because they want to keep doing business with you. Uh, and if they had a bad experience, they're going to say, hey, this is my chance to help them get better so other people don't go through what I went through. Uh, but you get really cool info. And it's, you know, it's some fun conversations because you get to talk then as peer to peer as opposed to vendor to client. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that we often miss out on, we did we did a, a virtual customer conference uh, a couple of months ago, and it was great because we had some of our customers present. And the great thing, obviously, about customers is a uh, great thing and a drawback sometimes is they will use your product in in or service in ways that you never imagined, right? Uh, be, yep. And and so it can be, you know, that can be a good thing, and sometimes it can be not so good. But but generally speaking, they're so fascinating. But if you don't ask them about this stuff, you would never learn it, and then you would never know to explore this with other people. Yeah, I I love having those types of conversations with clients, you know, especially after we've been working with them for a while, and then being able to go back and talk to them about their experience going through my process or uh, Donnie and my process when we're doing the coaching and uh, mm -hmm. sales training piece, and talking about you know what they liked and what they didn't like, and you know what caused them to make a decision, you know what were their concerns, and you know really digging into what was going in on in their head. So I could understand, all right, so here's the type of content we need to have so that, that people at different stages can get their questions answered easily. And we don't have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what to send them. It's just there. And we can tell where they're at by the type of content they're consuming. 
Yeah, no, because I think sometimes, unfortunately, when when somebody becomes a customer, like the salesperson just breathes a sigh of relief and then sort of treats it like it's a <gasps> it's a brittle it's a brittle thing. Like, don't breathe. It's a house of cards. Don't even breathe on it. <laughs> yeah, or it's that that big sigh of relief. It's like, oh, they signed a contract. Thank you, God. And then they're like, now I push you off to fulfillment. You know, I I always when I was doing tech sales, I like hounded my fulfillment people. And I wanted to know what was going on with those clients because I knew mm -hmm. if it, they weren't getting taken care of, I was the one they had a relationship with. I was the one they were going to call and complain to. And then I was going to derail all the other stuff I had planned to do that day because I would have to go fix them. So I always stayed involved because I wanted to make sure it was done right. And if I saw something not being done right, I could head it off before the client experienced it and make sure that they had that good, good, uh, experience getting uh, set up and started running the system because then I got referrals. Yeah, no, as I, I would say, I was thinking, you know, chameleons are like fun little reptiles, terrible when they're salespeople because you need consistency. So it's great if you're the wonderful person during the sales cycle and then the minute they sign on the dotted line, you push them off and suddenly you're not available and all of that. Uh, you know, and you set up this massive contrast between you pre-sales and post-sales. It's not a good thing. Yeah, it's it's really important for the persona that you present to be who you are as a salesperson yeah. because they, you're not going to be able to keep it up. And if you're changing your persona based on who your client is, you know, it's you're never going to remember who you're supposed to be at any given time. So it's you know, it is important for salespeople to understand who they're selling to, so you can adjust your tactics. Sure. But the base of your personality has to stay consistent because that's how, you know, do you act different with different friends? You know, the, mm -hmm. all the people who are in your inner circle is in uh, your friendship groups, you know, they should, they shouldn't know the real you and they get the real you and they're sticking around because they actually like the real you. So sales is the same way. The people who buy from you are going to like you and they're going to trust you and they're going to want to do business with you. But if you're putting up a, persona that's obviously not you it's not going to work yeah no it, it's not and particularly nowadays i think where people are i think people are tuned in a little more than they ever were maybe it's because of the pandemic maybe we're starting before that but i think people are a little bit more attuned to authenticity than ever before uh, so i think if you if you are inauthentic or if you have different faces for different people yeah it's, it's going to show through pretty quickly. Well, listen, Kevin, this is great. All of Kevin's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Kevin, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. So yeah, my name is Kevin Snow. I'm the CEO of Time on Target. And I help businesses figure out how to sell more effectively to their clients and how to utilize technology in that sales process so that their clients don't unsubscribe. They actually click through the emails and they make purchase decisions faster. Fantastic. Well, listen, thanks again, Kevin. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon.